Today we're going to do one of the most unique broadcasts that I have ever done, one of the most uh, unique teachings that I have ever presented in my 41 years of missions and evangelistic ministry all over the world. And the subject is, Will Our Pets Be in Heaven? Now those of you that have followed our ministry, many of you for multiple years, you're aware of the fact that much of my teaching as well as my preaching in our evangelistic outreaches and lost lamb outreaches uh, are directly related to questions that people ask me in my travels. And this question is the most frequent question that I have been asked concerning Bible prophecy, concerning uh, people's curiosity. Uh, will my pet be in heaven? Or what happens to my pet after the rapture? And the people that ask these questions through the years have been so sincere and oftentimes emotional. But if I'm honest with you, I've often given them the same answer and it's been somewhat condensed. Of course, many of you, your impulse would be to say, no, animals do not have souls and therefore our pets will not be in heaven. But as you're going to learn today, that's an inaccurate answer. Now, I'm not saying up front and giving you an ironclad guarantee that all of your pets are going to be in heaven, but I am going to reveal to you much on this subject that I promise you that most of you have never uncovered in the depths of Scripture. And my teaching style will not change. We're going to start in the Bible. We're going to stay in the Bible. We're going to finish in the Bible. But we're going to be dealing with questions like, will there be animals in heaven? Do animals have souls? How do the godly treat their pets? Can animals praise God? Will the pets of the righteous be in heaven? and much, much more. And so as always, we always lay down a foundational text, and for that we're going to go into the Old Testament and into the book of Isaiah, one of the major prophets of the Old Testament, and the 11th chapter, Isaiah chapter 11, and let's begin at verse 6. In that day... The wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Now most scholars agree that this passage that I've read to you out of the 11th chapter of Isaiah refers to a time on earth that is called the millennium or the millennial reign of Christ. And those of you that follow our teaching and our uh, in-depth series on Bible prophecy and eschatology, if you'll remember the chronology of prophecy that the next major prophetic event is the rapture of the church. Immediately after the rapture, we enter into a seven-year period of apocalyptic events called the Great Tribulation. At the end of the Great Tribulation, it is actually finalized by an event called the Second Coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture before the Great Tribulation, Christ coming for His saints, Jesus Christ coming at the end and ending the Great Tribulation is Christ returning with His saints. And after the second coming of Christ, 
a thousand year period of time called the millennium or the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And then after the millennial reign, the final judgment and we enter into eternity. And so most scholars, the passage that I read out of Isaiah chapter 11, they'll be quick to tell you that this passage is Isaiah prophesying and foretelling how the animal kingdom will be on the earth during the millennium. But I want you to remember something. Everything in the Bible, whether we're studying the book of Isaiah or we're studying any of the other 66 books in the Bible, we must remember that that entire book is a narrative. And most books of the Bible are not read in their entirety, but most Christians just read a chapter here and a chapter there and a verse here and a verse there. And in doing that, they really don't fully understand the total narrative of the book. And so when scholars say Isaiah 11 is Isaiah the prophet foretelling the events of animal kingdom life during the millennial reign, you have to back up one step and you have to consider the total narrative of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah writes about the eternal kingdom of God upon this earth. And uh, let me just help you with something, those of you that take notes. As long as we're in the book of Isaiah, go over to the 65th chapter, Isaiah chapter 65, and go down to verse 17. Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Go down to verse 25, Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 25. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow, but the snakes will eat dust. In those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. When are those days when no one will be hurt or harmed. That is not during the millennium or this current earth, but rather Isaiah is speaking about the new heaven and the new earth. And so for those who would point to Isaiah 11 in the passage that I read about the interaction and the change of the nature of the animal kingdom in the new heaven and the new earth, uh, there is room for deeper understanding on that rather than to just say uh, this is a cutoff. It only refers to that thousand year period of time called the millennium and does not represent heaven. To make that statement is not to consider the entire narrative of Isaiah. Furthermore, turn to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. And as I promised you in the beginning of this teaching, I think you're going to be completely amazed at how much the Bible has to say about the animal kingdom and their relation uh, to us as believers in eternity. But in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, the Bible said, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain, for all of these things are gone forever. And so as I've mentioned, uh, to my amazement, uh, this question on our relationship with animals, our relationship with our pets, uh, how does that unfold in the Bible concerning heaven, the new heaven and the new earth, that's what we're going to focus on today. And as always, I ask you to keep systematic notes because I think you're just going to have a jaw-dropping moment on several occasions as I begin to unveil for you in the Bible many of these things that are addressed. And uh, I've always pledged uh, to those of you that are listening throughout the entirety of my ministry and whether we're 
uh, preaching in our Law Slam outreaches or whether uh, I'm teaching in a session like this. This fall I'll be uh, teaching at North Point Bible College and Graduate School uh, for uh, certain dates and preaching and teaching are certainly different styles. Uh, preaching is the declaration of truth. Teaching is the explanation of truth. And there is a difference. They're not synonymous. And perhaps that might be good to write down in your notes as a student of the Bible. Preaching is the declaration of God's truth. Teaching is the explanation of God's truth. And of course, right now we're in teaching mode. We are doing an explanation of God's truth. Some of you are watching the broadcast live. Some of you might watch this on YouTube. Some of you might watch this on an archived video. Some of you are listening on our podcast channel. And whatever means that you're listening, I want you to understand with clarity that I'll always do my utmost to teach the Bible with an unbiased devotion to the text, the context, and whatever the Bible author intended to convey to his listeners. But with that said, I have to be honest in telling you that this subject, Will Our Pets Be in Heaven, is fairly close to my heart. And I'm going to do my best to be unbiased, but if I cross that line in this teaching, I'm asking for your grace and for your mercy. Uh, because I must confess that in our family, we have always had dogs since our children uh, were little, and I have always grown to deeply love uh, each and every one of our, of our dogs. And as far as my wife is concerned, uh, let me just put it to you this way concerning loving our dogs. My personal goal in life is to one day have the love and the lifestyle of my dog. Uh, our dogs have never lived in dogs' houses. Our dogs have never been tethered on chains in the backyard. Our dogs have always lived in our house and been pretty much adopted as family and were a part of the family. And some of you might be surprised that even that is biblical, even in the Bible. Animals were not always just treated as utilitarian. They were not just farm animals or work animals, but there was a relationship that was deeper than that even in the Bible. Uh, if you have your Bible open to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel and the 12th chapter, and let me reveal to you what I believe to be one of the most affectionate passages in the Bible uh, concerning pets. 2 Samuel chapter 12 Go down to verse 3. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. And so there, even in the passages of the Old Testament, we read that there was a unique relationship with animals beyond just a work beast or being used for food, etc. Uh, there was a tenderness between the heart of the animal and the heart of the pet owner. And many of you can identify with that. Now I am going to pause in this teaching just long enough to give you a quick history uh, of our dogs and our family uh, through the years because I think in fairness of teaching uh, I need to do this because if you do detect bias at least you'll have an understanding as to where that bias comes from. But our first dog was a female black lab mix that my wife rescued and we named that dog Candy. And Candy made the journey with us from our move to from Pennsylvania here to the state of Maine, and most of that trip, well over a thousand miles, that dog, full grown, sat in my lap with its head on my shoulder almost the entire journey as she was a little distraught leaving uh, the only home she had ever known. She was the very first pet to enter our home when our children were young. She was loving 
and uh, a loyal dog that quickly became a part of our family. And what was unique about our first dog, Candy, is Candy was the dog that took my wife to the school of how to thoroughly spoil a dog. Candy trained my wife completely, and Judy passed with uh, 4.0 in how to thoroughly spoil a dog. And uh, Candy lived nine years and was the first dog that I had to bury under the pine grove in the first uh, and front four acres of our property. Our second dog was a female golden retriever that we named Honey. And Honey was a very special dog and a gift from God to my wife. Honey helped to provide love and companionship uh, in a very difficult time uh, in my wife's life and somewhat mine as well. And that was when our son grew up and went to college and then shortly thereafter our daughter uh, went to college and we entered into what many people call empty nest syndrome. Now some people are happy to see their children grow up and leave home, but my wife's world fell apart when our children left home. I don't think any child in all of human history could have had a better mother than our children had in my wife Judy. Uh, she was totally and completely devoted to our children. And uh, I'm not laying this down as legalistic law, but in ministry I always prayed that God would help this ministry and bless this ministry so that uh, Judy, when our children were growing up, could devote her undivided attention to our children because I felt a great cross in being gone so much as an evangelist in my travels all over the world. And I felt that in our home, and I'm just speaking on behalf of our home, but I felt like in our home with my constant travels and journeys around the world and being absent so much from our home and from our supper table and from the activities of our children's life and their growing up, I really prayed that, that God would help us so that Judy could devote her full-time uh, life and energy uh, to the children, which is what we did. And we had to make sacrifices for that, but none of which either of us, I'm sure, uh, would regret. But when Jonathan left home and then Jessica, our daughter, left home, and entered into Bible college. Both of our children now are married in full-time ministry and have children of their own. But when they left our home, uh, my wife fell apart. It was not uncommon to find her in the bedroom in the fetal position, crying and uh, wiping tears. And Honey was a gift from God at that time, no doubt about it. Uh, honey never left my wife's side and was her constant companion and walked her through some of that difficult season of life. And uh, sadly, uh, Honey only lived uh, to be a little over eight years old. And if my memory serves me right, uh, she died uh, most unfortunately somewhere around, in fact it may have been uh, the Mother's Day weekend. And I thought Judy's heart would never heal and I thought her tears would never stop. She was inconsolable uh, when I buried Honey next to Candy uh, underneath the pine grove in our front four acres. And I knew immediately what needed to happen and I had already been doing some homework in the background as uh, Honey became ill in that last part of her life. And I visited a breeder with Judy about an hour uh, from our house. Uh, I, I wanna say it was maybe the next day or a day or two right after we had buried Honey. And when we arrived at that uh, breeder's farm, uh, a little puppy, Chubby, uh, another golden retriever, uh, came running across the grass and uh, rolled over on my cowboy boots and stared up at me with those little chocolate eyes and fluffy little golden fur and a warm, chubby, pink belly, tail wagging. And uh, I, I picked uh, that little puppy up and hollered over to Judy, write the check, I'll be in the truck. And uh, that's how Hunter 
came into our life and uh, he is our third dog and Hunter's still alive. Uh, Hunter's now 12 years old, going on 13 and has lived longer than any dog that we've ever had. And you could not ask for a better dog than Hunter. It's very sad to watch uh, pets get elderly. His fur is now more white than golden. His back legs are getting tired. He can't go on the long walks that uh, we usually take our dogs on once or twice a day. He is no longer able to do that. And uh, he'll go on short walks and we kind of let him dictate as to what he's able to do. Uh, he has great difficulty climbing the two sets of steps up to the bedroom where uh, he has a home in our king-sized bed. And uh, he's a full uh, bred uh, golden that is uh, what they call a hunting breed, which is the biggest breed of goldens and honey weighs somewhere in the area of 120 pounds. He's a big, loving boy that has been well cared for and thanks to my wife, uh, too well fed. And if I'm going to be honest with you, uh, there's never been a time that I have had to take uh, either Candy or our second dog Honey to the vet uh, to face the end of their life that I couldn't think of at least half a dozen people that I could have put to sleep easier than putting my pets together. And I know that's awful. Uh, I know that's terrible. What a terrible thing for a minister, a man of God to say, but I'm just being honest. Uh, I, I could, and I think if I'm being really honest, half a dozen is probably a conservative figure of people I could think of that I could put to sleep easier than my dogs. As I'm speaking, I can think of at least uh, half a dozen politicians. Uh, well, Lord, forgive me for that, and I apologize and ask you to help me as I go forward to be less carnal. Anyway, if, uh, if that's sin, you pray that God uh, will forgive me. But I'm going to tell you something. If people in the world were as loving and as loyal and as forgiving as dogs are, our world would be a much better place. Uh, the famous historic humorist and television star by the name of Will Rogers said, quote, If there are no dogs in heaven, then when I die... I want to go where they went, end of quote. And many of you that are listening understand what I'm describing. And for many of you, it's not a dog. Uh, it's a cat. Or for some people, uh, it's a herd of cats. Or it's farm animals. Or uh, one of our viewers has a pet donkey. And many of you have various animals, rabbits. Kids have turtles, guinea pigs. I mean, the list is endless of pets that people have and love. And uh, I've often said, by the way, do you know what the main difference is between uh, a dog owner and a cat owner? Is that dogs have family, and as all cat owners know, cats have staff. But uh, that just kind of gives you a little bit of a background as to our family and our history with pets. And uh, I'm being honest with you. This is a question that I've asked, and this is a question that I've looked at in the scriptures. And from this point forward, I'm going to walk you in to many of those passages that you've never seen concerning what God has said about proper relationship between humanity and the animal kingdom. Because there are some extreme groups on this earth that violate what God intended and some on one side, and some on the other. Uh, the truth be known, uh, there are Christians who have unhealthy relationships with pets that violate, as you're going to learn, what the Bible teaches. But with that said, let's go back into the Bible, and let's answer this first question. And this first question, for those that take systematic notes, what does the Bible say about how we should treat animals. And for that, let's go back into the book of Genesis. And for sake of history, isn't it unique that in the very first book of the Bible, 
And the very first chapter of the Bible, in the creation and in the beginning of time, God speaks about animals and humanity. Genesis chapter 1, and go down to verse 24. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our own image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Isn't it unique that God created animals and human beings on the sixth day and on the same day? God in the Bible, we see recorded, saved the sixth day, not to create humanity alone, not just to create Adam and Eve, not to designate a special day for man being created in his own image, but he delegated that day to two acts of creation. First, he created the animals, and then on that sixth day, he did a second task. He created man in his own image. And I've always wondered, and obviously in this teaching, there's going to be some room for wondering and, and thinking and uh, your own views, although we will stay rooted in the scripture as we move forward. But I have always wondered as an animal lover, uh, since animals and humans were created on the same day, could that be why most normal human beings have an affection towards pets or towards animals? So we see in the very first uh, chapter of the Bible that God commanded man, created animals first, then created man in his own image, and then commanded man to take care of the animals under our care. He created us on the same day, the sixth day, and after he created man, after he had already created animals, he spoke to Adam and said, it is your responsibility to provide proper care and authority over the animal kingdom. Did you know that the Bible also teaches us that caring for animals is a sign of godliness? Let's go into Proverbs chapter 12. And for some of you, this will be a new discovery. That how you treat animals is a test of your godliness. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10. The Bible says the godly care for their animals. But the wicked are always cruel. Now, I could put a lot of personal commentary in that, but since I'm teaching the Bible, I'll abstain from that, other than to say that oftentimes sinners and wicked people and cruelty to animals walk hand in hand. If you see, now this is biblical, this is not speculation, but if you see someone who is unkind or cruel or mean-spirited to an animal, then most oftentimes you can be guaranteed that they're not a godly person. Now again, the Bible uh, spoke of various classes of animals, as we've already read in the first chapter of Genesis. Some of them were wild animals. And if we were to take the time, and that's not our teaching today, and so I'm not going to go down that road very far, other than to say, God gave animals also in the wild kingdom as not only a part of maintaining ecosystems, 
but to provide food for man. And let me say something that I hope you'll never forget. Animals are not equal to man. Man is in authority and above the animals. But as you're going to see in multiple passages, God created a unique relationship of harmony to exist between humanity and the animal kingdom. I don't believe it to be cruel uh, because a lot of people that are Christians assault hunters. And that's not a proper attitude as well because God gave animals for men. He did not give men and that animals reign above us and we're lesser caretakers. As a matter of fact, the very first person to kill an animal was God. In the Garden of Eden, He provided fur clothing and covering for Adam and for Eve. And of course, in the Old Testament, we're aware of animal sacrifice. And so there are some things in the Bible that some might scratch their head when it comes to cruelty to animals, but I'm going to explain that as we move forward. But I'm talking about unnatural cruelty. Even as a hunter, and for those that are hunters within the sound of my voice, you should be an expert hunter. You should take time to know your rifle or your weapon when you hunt. You should be able to put that first shot into the kill zone so that the animal dies immediately without suffering. And I've known of hunters who have been cruel and purposely cruel, and I'll not describe that uh, because it's a little graphic. But I am going to tell you that hunting does not violate the Bible, but if you're a Christian, you should be an expert in your field of hunting. You should be an excellent marksman. You should not kill animals just to put on your wall, but you should kill animals if you're going to be a hunter to provide food. But just to kill an animal to make a mount on a wall, I find that uh, as a violation of Scripture. Uh, they were not given to kill in cruelty for the sake of artwork on your homes. Now, there's nothing wrong with mounting an animal. I have the very first deer that I shot in the state of Maine mounted. But I didn't kill it to mount it. I kill it because I like deer meat. So be careful, those of you who feel like uh, you should never kill an animal. And remember that the Bible teaches that God gave the wild kingdom as a part of sustaining the food of men. Now that's as far as I want to go down that road. We could go a lot further. Let's get back to the exact subject that we're teaching here. Not only should a godly man care for his own animals, does the Bible teach us. The Bible says that a godly man will even care for his neighbor's animals or for the animals of people who may even hate you. You might be surprised to know that that's in the Bible. Uh, go to the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, and go to verse 23. Exodus 23 and go down to verse 4. If you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey that is straight away, take it back to its owner. If you see that the donkey of someone who hates you has collapsed under its load, do not walk by, instead stop and help. And so again, the Bible has much to say about the relationship between mankind and the animal kingdom and dealing with animal cruelty. Now remember, God in the creation of animals created classes of animals, and this is referring to animals that are within our care and our keeping. And again, wild animals oftentimes are used for food and for clothing. Uh, it's not a sin to wear fur. You know, many of you realize that I have been uh, going to uh, remote villages in Alaska and preaching in various parts of Alaska for 17 years. And in one village that I entered into, uh, a woman that got saved, and it was about 30 or 40 below uh, zero. I was there in uh, dark winter, what they call dark winter, where there's usually three or four hours of uh, 
just barely dusk or light. And after the service, a woman who had given her heart to Christ came up to me and uh, she said, where's your hat? And uh, it was in the room where I was speaking. There was no church. And I showed her my wool hat. And uh, of course, I had a parka that I could pull up over my wool hat in, in temperatures like that. But she just looked at me and said, that's not a hat. And uh, she said, stand still. And she stood there and looked at my head and walked around me, I think, three times. And then the next night, she came back with a hat. And that hat was made out of leather. It was made out of uh, black beaver. And it was made out of sea otter. And it's the nicest, warmest hat I've ever had for severe conditions. I still wear it all the time. And uh, even sometimes in my travels, I was in Pennsylvania and I was ministering there at a Lost Lamb event and uh, it was winter and the pastor saw my fur hat and when I told the story, he said, you need to show that to our people uh, tonight when you speak. And I thought, Pastor, are you sure? Surely in a church as large as yours, it was a large church. I said, surely in a ch church as large as yours, somebody's going to be offended if I show them a fur hat. He said, ah, I don't think you'll have to worry about that here. Uh, it's a part of your missionary story. I think people would be moved by it. Uh, that church had helped us in one of our humanitarian projects in Alaska. And so I obeyed the pastor before I began to preach that night. I showed them the hat and told the story. And sure enough, I heard this, uh, what seemed to be elderly female voice yell out from the crowd, is that real fur? And uh, I immediately responded and I said, uh, yes, ma'am, this, this is real fur. Unfortunately, the polyester sea otter is extinct now in Alaska. And, uh, but some people get very uptight about fur. But God was the very first furrier in the Bible, just so that you'll know it's in the Bible. Uh, most students of the Bible are not aware that in the Ten Commandments, uh, of course, most of you know, if you're a student of the Bible, that in the Ten Commandments, we are told to have a day of rest. We're told and required by God as a part of the covenant to work no more than six days, but the seventh day must be a day of rest. But that day of rest is not just for us. God created the day of rest for animals as well. As long as we're in Exodus, go back to the 20th chapter. Exodus chapter 20. And go down to verse 8, Exodus 20 verse 8. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. God not only required man to take a day of rest every week, He required you to rest your animals one day every week. Turn over to uh, Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 12. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day you must stop working. This gives your ox and your donkey a chance to rest. It also allows your slaves and the foreigners living among you to be refreshed. Uh, Dr. Billy Graham, my hero in evangelism, uh, said this, quote, The Bible says we must never treat any part of God's creation with contempt. When we do, we are indirectly treating our Creator with contempt. Instead, God calls us to be stewards or trustees of His creation. 
And the Bible reminds us that we are responsible to Him for the way that we treat it. We've often forgotten this, but it's still true. And when we ignore it, we not only hurt God's creation, but we also hurt ourselves. End of quote. What a unique passage from one of my books in my library written by Dr. Billy Graham. We must never forget, this is vitally important if you're taking notes, with all that I've taught you so far, with much more to come in the scriptures, we must pause and make this note. We must never forget that God must be first in our lives. No pet No furry friend should have a place in our heart or our home comparable to our relationship, our devotion, our loyalty, and our consecrated love to God. Now I'm going to get to one of the most unique questions that people ask in this matter. And the question, if you're taking notes, is this. Number two, do animals have souls. And the average Christian would impulsively say, absolutely not, let's move on. But I think you're going to be surprised at how much the Bible has to say about this. So let's go on in our teaching and back into the Bible and let's answer the question, do animals have souls? Uh, Just like humans, Animals were formed out of the dust of the ground. Did you know that? Now you've already learned that perhaps in unique and eternal harmonious relationship that on the sixth day God only created two things. He first created the animal kingdom and then He created man in His own image and gave man a command to responsibly care for the animal kingdom We've already addressed how that might explain why there has always been in the heart of a normal person a unique affection for animals and the desire to have a a pet perhaps in the home. But animals and humans on the sixth day were formed in identical pattern. They were both created out of the dust of the ground. And I can hear your questions already. Where in the world is that in the Bible? Well, we've already taught from Genesis chapter 1. It shouldn't surprise you that it's in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals, formed from the ground, all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Now go down to verse 7 in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Then the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground, just as he had created the animals, he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. And it's from this passage and other teachings that many people draw the clear line and would impulsively react and say, There's the difference. God breathed into us the breath of life and we became a living soul. And so both animals and man were created from the dust of the ground in similar pattern. But what separates man from the animal kingdom is man was made in the image of God, number one. And number two, God breathed the breath of life into man and man became a living person. Uh, A wonderful author, and some of you might be familiar with 
this brilliant author and scholar of the Bible. His name is Randy Alcorn. But let me read to you a passage that I was reading in my research. Uh, Randy Alcorn wrote this quote, When God breathed a spirit in the Adam's body made from the earth, Adam became nephesh. Now that's Hebrew. We'll come back to that. When God breathed the spirit into Adam's body made from the earth, Adam became nephesh. And by the way, that's spelled, uh, it's Hebrew, but spelled in English N-E-P-H-E-S-H. Not critical that you remember that, but if you want to do some further study on that, in your own Bible dictionaries and word study uh, library, you can. And it means a living being or soul. Still reading the quote. Let me go back to the beginning. Quote, when Adam, or excuse me, when God breathed a spirit into Adam's body made from the earth, Adam became nephesh, a living being or soul. Remarkably, the same Hebrew word, nephesh, is used for animals and for people. We are specifically told that not only people, but animals have the breath of life in them. God handmade animals, linking them both to the earth and humanity. End of quote. What an incredible gold nugget of biblical understanding on this question, do animals have souls? Now, don't repeat and say, Tiff said that animals have souls, because I have not said that yet. I'm carefully walking you through the Bible and will draw a conclusion at the end of this defense. But here we see in the Bible that the Hebrew word, when God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul, the Hebrew word is nephesh. But it's the exact same word in the original Hebrew text referring to when he created animals and they became living creatures, that same word in the original Hebrew is identical, nephesh. I am not saying that animals have souls at this point, but I do want to be absolutely clear in stating, as I've already said, animals and human beings are distinctly different. We will never cross that line because to cross that line is heresy. It's just flat out inerrant. The Bible clearly articulates there is a difference between humanity and the wild kingdom. But what I am saying, and I'm walking slowly and repetitively because I want you to be clear on this, that both animals and man in the creation process were both created out of the dust of the ground. And when the Bible says of man, God breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. The Hebrew word nephesh is the exact same word that refers to how God breathed life into the wild kingdom. Only human beings, men and women, were created in the image of God. But I am going to come back to this for clarity. There is strong evidence when you read Hebrew scholars and when you read their understanding of original Hebrew text that there is some type of soul specific to animals. Now again, they don't have a soul like we have. But because of the word nephesh in the Hebrew, it absolutely, explicitly means that God breathed into them a breath of life. And there is much scholarship 
that throughout church history would allow for biblical, textual, Hebraic evidence that animals have some type of soul that's specific only to them. As a matter of fact, if you were a student of church history, what you would discover is that up until the 17th century, the classic understanding of living things included the doctrine that both humans as well as animals have souls. Now, not identical, but based from the Hebrew and that word we've mentioned multiple times, nephesh, that when God created animals out of the dust in the same model that He created man in His own image, He breathed into Adam the breath of life and gave to him a living soul. The same word nephesh in the creation of the animal kingdom, God breathed life into living creatures. And there is much and strong biblical scholarship that would support the possibility that animals have some type of soul, not like man. I've said that multiple times, not like man's soul, exclamation point. But strong biblical scholarship that animals have some type of soul. The scripture, however, does not give enough detail about animals and whatever kind of soul or nephesh exists beyond their perishing. That's where we don't have enough biblical scholarship to begin to wrap details around this concept, biblical concept of nephesh. What happens to that animal when they die? There's not enough in the Bible to make a strong definitive argument that would withstand the test of higher criticism about the eternal state of an animal after they die. But what is absolutely true in the Bible is that God created animals out of the dust of the ground in the same method that He created us, and that as He breathed into man the breath of life, nephesh, He breathed into the living creatures, nephesh. And there is a possibility that there is some type of soul that an animal possesses. How much of it is identical or parallel to the soul of man again. That's where we have to draw a line of scholarship and say there's not enough detail other than creation for us to unravel a narrative that we pet owners would like to take it to. But we do know that without question, the Garden of Eden was a perfect paradise before sin and the curse. And that in the beginning, that God had created animals and man together on the sixth day, and God obviously had a harmonious plan for their existence together. All right, let's draw some conclusions from the scholarship and from the passages of the Bible that we've revealed to you thus far. Therefore, this is a con a conclusion that we're drawing from where we're at. It's not the end of the message by any means. We're just getting started. There's much in this teaching. As I've said, I promised you that many of you are going to be surprised at how much is in the Bible on this subject. But let's just draw a conclusion and a summary for where we've come from to where we're at right now. Therefore, it is both logical and theological to state that in heaven when we are brought back into perfect relationship with God and sin is no more, at that time, God is going to restore the original harmonious relationship that He intended for animals and human beings to enjoy. That much we can say and be perfectly accurate from the Bible without any supposition, without any inerrancy. We've laid out that case from the Bible, and that is a conclusion that I think is absolute. Because the Garden of Eden, listen carefully, the Garden of Eden before sin, before the fall of sin, before Adam's sin, before the curse, 
the Garden of Eden before sin and the curse was the perfect paradise of God's creation. Very simple. And in that perfect creation, there was a very special bond and relationship harmoniously executed between man as the authority and the caretaker and the wild kingdom. So it is therefore logical and theological to assume that in heaven, once the curse of sin is no more, for there will be no sin and there will be no curse in heaven, that heaven will be restored to the paradise of what the Garden of Eden was like. And therefore logical and theological to assume that the wild kingdom and animals as they were in perfect harmony in the Garden of Eden, in heaven they will be in perfect harmony once again. Now, we've laid that down as a summation. Let's walk a few steps further. And I've asked the Lord to help me to make this clear. I've asked the Lord to help me to communicate this to you because you can imagine as an evangelist and as a, a world missionary that in our Lost Lamb events, I would never have an occasion in preaching to an unsaved or an unreached audience to ever speak on such a subject because it's not the gospel. It's not a subject that lends itself towards evangelistic preaching. But it is a subject that would certainly fall under biblical teaching and all believers should have a grasp of Bible knowledge. And I think that for many of you this is going to help you and encourage you because there are several other things in this study on will our pets be in heaven that are going to come along as I unravel these passages, each and every one that many of you are going to learn some things. All right, let's take it a step further. Further biblical evidence can be seen in the story of Noah and the ark. The story of Noah and the ark in the Bible and in the Old Testament is the most detailed of all of the Bible stories. And of course, we know it's more than a story. It's, it's, it's a factual account. But it is the most detailed picture of God's redemptive work in the entirety of the Old Testament. Let's talk about that just for a moment. God caused Noah to go through great and miraculous efforts, not only to preserve and to protect the human race, but to preserve and to protect the animal kingdom. I want you, we're going to obviously, as we always do, start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish in the Bible. Uh, I want you to see how many times in this account that God personally references animals and creatures. Go to Genesis chapter 9. And as we're coming to the top of the hour, I'm going to finish on this point. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 9. And I'm going to read down through verse 17. Now as I read, perhaps you might want to highlight in your Bible how many times animals and creatures are mentioned by God. Genesis chapter 9 verse 9. I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Then God said, I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures. For all generations to come, I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. 
when I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds, and I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on the earth. Then God said to Noah, yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant. I am, I am confirming with all the creatures on the earth. So in this unique passage that deals with the judgment of God and the story of Noah and the ark and this redemptive story, God mentions the animals and the creatures eight different times. When God restored the earth after the floodwaters of judgment, He included the animals then. Very important for you to understand that sentence that I just gave to you. When God restored the earth after the flood and after His judgment, He certainly included the animals then. And from this type, because Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that God in the Old Testament gave us many types, examples, and shadows of things to come. That after the final judgment, when God restores the new heaven and the new earth, He certainly is going to include the animals as well. And uh, I would love to go on because uh, I think this is intriguing. I know it is to me as uh, an animal lover and uh, one who's had pets uh, throughout all of my adult life and with our family and children and even to this day. But I think this is going to be a good place to pause. And in part two of this series, Will Our Pets Be in Heaven? I'm going to pick up with the incredible Bible stories as to how God used animals in ministry repeatedly. And you're going to learn perhaps something you've never seen before or have seen but not identified, that God not only used human beings to conduct ministry, on multiple occasions, God used animals to conduct ministry ministry. And then we're going to also answer the question, uh, can animals give God praise? And uh, I am going to just give you a heads up on that. Uh, absolutely. There are multiple passages in the Bible that show us that both on this earth and in the new heaven and in the new earth, that God has animals as a part of of the praise process. You're going to see that in eternity that praise has been given to angels, to humanity, and to the animals. And then we're going to come back to the question of will our pets be in heaven and we're going to take that into a different level of explanation from other passages as well as helping you to discover uh, some things about the potential of the righteous and the animals of the righteous and how that applies to life after death. A lot of meat left on this bone. What an appropriate analogy for talking about pets. But I promise you, there's a tremendous amount of meat left on this bone from the Bible that we're going to cover. And now as you've been listening, I think you can see that I've kept my promise to you that this title was not just clickbait, this title was just not something to attract viewers, but it is a genuine response from my heart in research and study and my life notes on this subject that I, for the first time in my life, have put together. You're hearing it taught for the first time in 41 years of ministry, answering the question, because the last time I was asked the question, it was asked from a little boy whose dog had just died, and though I gave him a, a brief uh, answer, obviously after a, a lost lamb event and people waiting, parents waiting, I couldn't take the time that I've taken with you, 
But I remember driving back to my hotel that night and praying for that little boy that God would help heal his heart because all of us that have pets that have lost pets, uh, we know the incredible grief that goes with that. At least with our loved ones who are saved, we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And so there's a unique dimension of grief that many pet owners feel because the question is in the heart, what happened to my pet? And uh, so we're going to come back to that. And again, I'll promise you in part two, just as I kept my promise in part one, you're going to find multiple passages in the Bible that you've overlooked that give us much, much uh, detail uh, going forward on that. So let me just hit pause right there on part one, and we'll come back to answer these further questions in part two of Will Our Pets Be in Heaven? But let me ask you a question. The most important thing is not is your pet in heaven, but will you be in heaven? And as I've also alluded to, what if one of God's glorious surprises, because God can do anything. I mean, if you're asking the question, can God allow our pets to be in heaven? God can do anything. And it wouldn't surprise me if one of the wonders of heaven might be the reuniting of pets with righteous owners. And uh, so if you're asking me, can God do anything? I don't hesitate to answer that. With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. And if God wants to do that as a part of the great joy and uh, blessing of heaven, then he can do that. But we'll answer it from the Bible in part two. But I want to ask you a question before we close. Whether you're listening to this broadcast live, whether you're listening to an archived video, a YouTube channel, uh, our podcast, uh, this preacher really cares about you. And I want you to be ready to meet the Lord because heaven is real. Eternity is real. Hell is real. And you only have two options after you die and you must make that decision while you're still on this earth. Wouldn't you like to know and have the peace in your heart that you're right with God, that all of your sins are forgiven, and that you'd be ready to meet the Lord? Recently, a mother emailed uh, the office here, and I read more than once uh, her email and her letter. She had forwarded one of our broadcasts to her son, who was unsaved, and there was a delay in his response, but he sent uh, a picture on his cell phone to his mother of of him viewing the broadcast. And he wrote in that letter, I called my girlfriend and I told her, I want to get right with God. I want to have a right relationship with God. Would you like to have a right relationship with God? It's as simple as ABC. According to the Bible, it's as simple as ABC to get right with God, to repent of sin, to know that your heart is right with the Lord. A, you have to admit your sin B, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. And C, you have to make a commitment to Him. And you can do that right now. You can pray with me. Many people call this a sinner's prayer. But wherever you're at, no matter where you're at in the world, no matter where you're at in life, you can be made right with Christ Jesus the Lord right now. Pray this prayer with me in childlike faith. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I felt you speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be right with God. I want to know my sins are forgiven and that it is well with my soul. Today I confess my sin and I'm willing to repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus Christ. I receive salvation as the gift of God. And I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what I ought to be. And I ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen.
come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, come in to my heart, Lord Jesus.